The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We gather here to commend Melvin Becker to God our Father and to commit his body to earth. Let us express our common faith in the resurrection. As Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, we too are called to follow him through death to the glory where God will be all in all. We hear these words in sacred scripture. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Our Lord said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead and see, I am alive forever and ever, and I have the keys of death and Hades. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Let us pray. Lord our God, you are great, eternal, and utterly to be trusted. You give life to all of us. Give us now your spirit of comfort and hope. Set our hearts at peace, so that we may bring our thanks and needs before you without fear. In the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Melvin D. Mel Becker, 83, of Mound Ridge, Kansas, passed away Tuesday the 12th, 2021 at Mercy Hospital. He was born August 20th, 1937 in Gossel, the son of Harry H. and Francis Becker Becker. He graduated from Mound Ridge High School at the class of 1957. Mel was united in marriage to Catherine, Kathy Kane, on April 6, 1958 in Montezuma, Kansas. Mel and Kathy had two years of voluntary service at Rancho Los Amigos in Downey, California. He survived, she survives of their home. Over the years, Mel farmed wheat, milo, beans, and sunflowers at his farm in Mound Ridge. He was a member of Westside Mennonite Church where he served as deacon and an usher. Mel was a farm equipment mechanic. He was employed at Gehring Hardware in Mound Ridge for 20 plus years. He had previously worked for Idaho Timber in Halstead, Bradbury in Mound Ridge, and Unruh Foster John Deere dealership in Montezuma. Mel enjoyed woodworking, including restoring the farmhouse by recarving the woodwork one room at a time. His greatest joy was spending time with his children and grandchildren, attending many of their events and activities throughout the years. He is also survived by his three sons, Kyle Becker of McPherson, Kurt Becker of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Ken and Denise Becker of Lincoln, Nebraska, and two grandchildren, Isaiah Becker of Omaha, Nebraska, and Brogan Becker, and fiance Jay Dunwall of Philomath, Oregon. Mel was preceded in death by his parents, brother Carl Becker, and infant sister Lois Becker. words from a dear friend of ours from the family so uh, this is from Gary Fisher uh, he writes I have known Mel for 50 years met him in 1972 just prior to my move to Mound Ridge we were preparing to join each other in a strategic plan to lead our Mound Ridge Boy Scout Troop 135 to a higher level of scouting effort Mel and his three sons Kyle Kurt and Ken along with my two sons Wayne Glenn worked together in the troop and with other troop members to eventually achieve three Eagle Scout Awards during the next 15 years. The Eagle Scout Awards were as follows. Kyle Becker, son of Mel and Kathy Becker, Glenn Fisher, son of Gary and Rosemary Fisher, Rick Nielsen, son of Larry and Sandy Nielsen. Mel, Larry, and myself led the majority of the training for the troop. Mel was always ready for meetings, campouts, and trips. I can say for myself, Kathy, Larry, that we will remember him with admiration our families will never forget him. I invite you to stand and join us in singing When Peace Like a River. The words are in number 336 in the blue hymnal or also on the screen.
Hear this reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 to 17. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know me. You do know him and have seen him. Pray this morning that the words of my lips and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable and pleasing to our God, our rock, and our Redeemer. Jesus knew that his time was short, so he spoke to his disciples about what would come next. There'd be trials, but take heart, he had conquered the world. There'd be loss, but he was sending the Holy Spirit to accompany them and remind him of their words. They would face death, but death is not the end. Do not let your hearts be troubled, said Jesus. Believe in God, believe also in me. And when he says believe, Jesus means put your trust in me. That trust is in Jesus' person, who he is as the Son of God, but it's also a trust of, because of what Jesus has done and what he will do. Jesus said, in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. He says, I go and prepare a place for you, and I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there will you be also. But then Jesus says something intriguing, something surprising, something that we don't expect him to say. Jesus tells the disciples, you know the way to the place where I am going. The disciples are immediately confused. Lord, they say, we do not know where are you going. How can we know the way? And that's when Jesus utters those famous words. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Which is to say that Jesus is the key to knowing the heart of God. This is why Jesus also says in verse 7, if you know me, you will know my Father also. You see, without Jesus, all of our attempts to worship God or come to God or pray to God are going to miss the mark. It means that Jesus is the key to our salvation and that in committing our lives to him in faith, we will find eternal life with him. And it means all other paths, however enticing, will never get us to where we need to go. And all this sheds light on what Jesus means when he says, you know the way. The first thing that Jesus is saying is that in so much as we know him, we know the way. The way isn't a map. It's not a book. It's not a series of philosophical propositions. The way is a person. The way is alive. It has a heartbeat. So if we want to know the way to God, then we have to grow in knowing Jesus more and more deeply. And we'll know Jesus by, by reading his life and words in the gospel. We'll know Jesus through worship, especially in coming to the table where he promises to give us his very flesh and blood. And we can talk to him and get to know him through prayer. But to really know Jesus, to really know him, is to follow him. It's to seek to conform our life to his. It's to desire to take his example to heart. To know Jesus is to have Jesus' words reverberating through our ears. To begin to act on Jesus' impulses, it's to love with Jesus' love, to yearn for what Jesus yearns for. But don't get the wrong idea. Following Jesus is more than just following his example. It's not like what you do when you, you know, have somebody that you admire and you know, maybe we really want to lean into that person's example, you know, a famous person. Following Jesus is more than that. To follow the Jesus way is about relationship with Jesus. There will be moments when we will sense his leading. We will go to him in times of celebration, but also in times of hardship and struggle. We will experience moments of his nearness that we will not fully be able to understand or wrap our heads around, but we will know deep in our bones that they are undeniably real. And sometimes... In following Jesus on his way, we will find ourselves in places that we would never have imagined, doing things that we might not have thought we would have chosen for ourselves, 
Because step by step, Jesus has led us there. Jesus brought us forward, set us on an unexpected path. And you know, you've maybe heard that statement that the, the way is made by walking. Well, Jesus is getting at something kind of like that. He's sort of saying the way is known by walking. Jesus said, you know the place, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And the second thing Jesus was getting at is this age-old question, the question that all of us face as human beings at some point, um, probably at many points in our lives. What is the way that we should live? How should we live our lives? What should be important to us? What should we live for? You know, when you're a kid, you think that this is really just a matter of figuring out what kind of a job you're going to do when you grow up, right? And you find something that you like, become that teacher, that doctor, that firefighter, whatever it is. You know, it's always an astronaut, right? But when you're young, you think if you can just get that job figured out, then you'll know the way that you should live. But then we get bigger. You know, we grow up and we begin to realize that there is so much more to life than just the work that we do, that there are relationships and beliefs and commitments. And in, in any case, even the work that we do, there's, there's not just choosing that work, but there's also choosing how we will do that work. What I've discovered is that to follow the Jesus way is to lean into and learn a way of life. It's for all of life. To learn the way of Jesus is to do something that impacts our relationships and the work that we do and how we think about the world. Following the Jesus way isn't just one thing. Because it's about the relationship with him, following Jesus means that he meets us right where we're at and leads us in the unique contours of our life. Jesus will always be casting an invitation for us to go a little farther and take another step with him. And there's this, this place at the beginning of the Gospel of John where Jesus' identity is only just beginning to be revealed. And some of John the Baptist's students come to him and they, and they say to Jesus, they, they have some questions for Jesus, and they say to him, you know, where are you staying, right? And Jesus responds, come and see. And that's how I've experienced what it means to follow Jesus. There's always that invitation to come and see, to go a little further down the path with him. It's, it's, it's invitational, it's experimental. You know, a strange thing happens when we dare to walk the way with Jesus. It turns out that the more we seek to imitate his life and teaching, the more we start to become ourselves. We begin to live more comfortably in our own skins. We start to be more authentically who God created us to be. And this is a lifetime's journey. I suppose it requires more than a lifetime because I imagine growing into the, what, who God has created us to be as something that will continue into eternity. And part of what this means is that all of us, every single one of us, are going to be uniquely reflecting the life of Jesus. We have that potential within us. Each one of us will have some bit of God's grace that shines through us in a way that never happened before in the history of the world and that will never happen precisely in the same way again. You know, these are the things that we treasure in others. They're those little specks of God's grace. And I think too often we overlook how grace works its quirky way out in people. You know, one of the places that I caught a glimpse of God's grace in Mel's life was in the way that he worked with his hands. He knew his way around a wood shop, and he was continuously working in his house. Um, you know, Mel liked to get his hands dirty. He graded the dirt roads um, for the county. He farmed. I don't know if farming was a hobby or his job, but I, knew, I do know that Mel was committed to the earth and the care for the soil. One of our first in-depth conversations, the one, one of the first ones I ever had with Mel, uh, it was him explaining his understanding to me of best practices for preserving the soil microbiome. And you know, last week, I, I visited Mel in the hospital, and we were sitting there together. He was able to, to talk, and he told me this. He said, I have lived my life with an awe of God's miraculous and meticulous creation. That's why I became a farmer. When I heard that, I knew that was a line that I had to save. Mel served the church as an usher and a deacon. He explained many times that he wasn't totally sure that he wanted to be a deacon at first when that, that call came to him. 
but he felt that God was calling him to help the church get through some particularly challenging times that the church was facing. And so he said yes. And we worked through some pretty difficult situations together, and we had some tough conversations during his time as deacon. You know, Mel was involved in various forms of service. He and Kathy had that life-changing experience of doing voluntary service in, in the Los Angeles area. And I was, you know, imagine that, these young this young couple from small town Kansas and it ended up in Los Angeles and just kind of all that comes with that. Mel worked with MCC meat canning. And I remember once when a bunch of us were back in the canning area, and if you've ever done this, you know that MCC meat canning, it's very loud and it's kind of hot um, and it, you get a little bit messy. And so we were, you, everybody's got to be on task. They have to be sharp with what they're doing. And I remember there was this big um, kind of kettle where we were stirring the meat. They have these huge plastic paddles. And I was one of the guys that was stirring the meat back there during MCC meat canning. And you got to really keep it moving. And it's a lot of meat. And I guess I wasn't doing it with enough manly gusto or something because Mel took that paddle from my hands. It was so loud, I couldn't hear what he was saying. But he said something to me that over the noise, he, I think he said, you have to eat more Dutch chocolates. Um, and you know, Mel, I've tried to take that advice to heart. Of course, there's more we could say. You all knew Mel longer and more deeply. Those are just a few glimpses of God's grace refracting through the life of one man. You know, the way of Jesus is a way of grace. It's coming to understand more and more who we are in God. It's learning to recognize and set aside our false notions of ourselves. It's really entering into the work of becoming ourselves alongside of God. Thomas Merton, the great monk and man of prayer, says that we are called to share with God the work of creating the truth of our identity. We can evade this responsibility by playing with masks, and this pleases us because it can appear at times to be a free and creative way of living. It is quite easy, it seems, to please everyone. But in the long run, the cost and the sorrow come very high. To work out our own identity in God, which the Bible calls working out our salvation, is a labor that requires sacrifice and anguish, risk, and many tears. This is the thing. There's not really any alternative to becoming ourselves in God. We were made for God and we'll be restless until we rest in him. The Jesus way is a way of life. And all the other possibilities we try will ultimately be found wanting. And this is why Jesus came, to make it possible for us to follow his way and come to the Father. This is why he lived and died. And this is why Jesus continues to invite every human being, wherever we're at, to come and see and follow and know him. He's calling us to know the way. Amen. I invite you to join us in singing Amazing Grace. We'll sing verses 1 to 3 and verse 6. That is on the screen or on number 143 in your blue hymnal. We'll remain seated as we sing this one.
Let us pray together. God of grace, you have given us new and living hope in Jesus Christ. We thank you that by dying, Christ destroyed the power of death, and by rising from the grave, he opened the way to eternal life. Help us to know that because he lives, Mel lives with you, and we shall live also, and that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come shall be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Just a moment, we're going to sing How Great Thou Art. The words for that song will be on the screen. Again, you can also find them in a, the back pocket of the blue hymnal. After that, the family invites you to join them in processing to the West Side Cemetery for the committal service. I invite you to stand as you're able for this last song and to remain standing for the closing benediction. Beloved children of God, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>